Toby, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know we were talking earlier and kind of looking forward to this and getting and share, not only getting your message out there, but kind of sharing your story. I'm so thankful that we're here today. Thank you. It's so fun to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. So I like to uh, take people back. And what I mean by that is think of yourself when you were a nine-year-old Toby mm -hmm. and you were figuring out what you wanted to do with your life. Uh, what was it that you wanted to do? Well, I wanted to be a lawyer. I want, um, I grew up in a family with a single mom and about nine is when my, mo my mom left my dad. Um, and so we lived on welfare and food stamps and section eight housing. And to me, um, being a lawyer meant changing the cycle of poverty and getting out of that cycle. So for some reason, like lawyer just stuck in my mind. I was like, if you're a lawyer, you have enough money that you don't need food stamps, you know, like, um, so I wanted to be a lawyer forever. I actually went to law school and decided that actually that wasn't my path. So my nine-year-old path was definitely a lawyer. Yeah. Was it, was there some sort of influence? I know you mentioned your upbringing, but what, did you see someone on TV that kind of resonated with you? Actually, an attorney came to school and um, of course he was a male and I was just like, oh my gosh, like this would be so cool. Like to break this, it would be a gender barrier. It would be like an income barrier, like just to like break those um, ceilings, you know, break out of those patterns. I just thought it would be so cool. I, I thought he was the coolest guy ever. Mm, wow. Okay. I guess he had a, a great impression on you. Was it career day or he just kind of mm -hmm. showed yeah, up? Just like, I don't even know some weird random guy, but he had a huge impact like on my, you know, like my perception of what an education could get you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And did you make that known to like your entire family that this is what you want to do? Kind of set things in stone. Yeah. And it, yeah. And what was their reaction to that? Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not hundred percent sure, but everybody knows like once I say something, then I do it. So I'm pretty sure my family was like, okay, then she'll be a lawyer. Then like, she'll do it just because that's the way it, it always was. Yeah. Wow. And so obviously along your path, you must've hit a lot of challenges along the way. And did you ever question that decision? Like looking back where you like, maybe law, before you obviously yeah. went through law school, but did you ever say, maybe this isn't for me? Yeah, for sure. Um, my husband and I had been married for four years and found out that we were surprisingly expecting. And so that was like, oh, okay, maybe law school isn't in the cards. Like right now I'm going to be a mom in nine months. Um, but I decided to continue with path. So I took my daughter with me when we went to law school, we did it together as a, a threesome. Um, and we actually named her justice. Just, I find that, um, I've always been really compelled to seeking justice. Um, for people, for the underserved and for the silenced. Yeah. So, so I know we're about to, sh we're about to shift gears really fast. So speaking of justice, and you mentioned for the underserved, talk to us about when you first went to Guatemala. Okay. Um, there was so many things I didn't understand about what I was getting myself into, my family into. Um, I really just was looking for an experience that would grow that would allow us to grow closer together and our family to just bond. Um, like in just regular life, like there's a million directions and we're all going so many directions. And it felt like, it still feels like sometimes you don't even have time with the person that lives in your home. Like you're like, hey baby, hi honey, hi. You know, and you're just running out the door all the time. Um, so I just wanted to have that time. I wanted to like, capture that moment um so I kind of did that I talked my kids and my husband into 
taking a little road trip, we drove from Utah um, to Guatemala. So we drove through the States and then through the country of Mexico and then into this teeny little country that we'd never been to before that had never been like GPS. Um, we had like paper maps and it was so funny. Um, and like there was so much I didn't understand about malnutrition and developing country lifestyle and poverty in a, you know, in a developing country world. Um, so it was very eye-opening the first time we went. I was in my 30s and it really blew my socks off. Like as a 30-year-old woman who grew up in the United States in poverty, but the poverty level was just incredibly different once you walked into a developing country. Yeah, and looking back on that experience for you, how would you say that has changed the course of the trajectory of where you were headed before, if you can actually speak into that? Yeah, well, absolutely. So I thought this is going to be a three month um, adventure for my family. And then we're going to go back home and just go back to real life, you know, like just go back. Um, I didn't realize that what we were doing was just going to be like an major pivot. It changed the trajectory of our entire family. Um, because once we were there, I realized that seeing this way of life and seeing how people lived in a developing country um, and my daughters having this experience was so um, just so pivotal that I wanted to do this every year. And so when we came home, I just made this announcement. I'm like, okay, girls, like this is something we need. Like, it's like our souls need it. We need to be reminded. We need to be good, doing service. We need to be grateful, like on an annual basis so that we don't forget. So this changed everything. You know, that one decision that changes the path. This was my one decision. Yeah. And how would you say that impacted your daughters as well? Because how old were they at the time, that first time? Yeah, so they were young. They were six and 10. Um, and honestly, my oldest is nearly 21. So it's been, as you know, nearly 11 years. It's crazy to think. Um, and for her 21st birthday, she's like, Mom, all I want to do is spend that and spend my birthday with you in Guatemala. Like, that's where we want to, that's where she wants to celebrate. Um, you never know the like the impact that it's going to have. Um, I do know that they spent their summers doing service work and doing projects and feeding the hungry and you know visiting orphanages and delivering donations and all of those things. They had those were the experiences that they had every summer when we were together. Um, and all I can do is hope that it lit a fire. You know. It, like gave some ideas. I don't know that either of them want to necessarily like do what I'm doing. Um, but I think that no matter what, I think if you go once, um, it changes your life. I think if it, you go multiple times, it changes your life. I think that um, being a humanitarian doesn't have to mean that you leave, you know, that you leave your home and go to a developing country and doesn't have to mean that but I that's what I wanted for my girls was opportunities for them to be humanitarians speaking of be humanitarian did you know initially so after that first time you went to Guatemala and then came back did you know then that you wanted to start the organization or did that happen kind of years down the road yeah I knew then um but truthfully all I wanted and it was like it could be like just the most selfish reason because what I really wanted was a reason to spend the summers with my girls. So when we started, I was taking um, groups of teens with my girls and we were spending 30 days in country and they didn't get to bring their cell phones. They didn't get to bring any social media or any outside 
interactions or, you know, outside influences, but I got to have them for 30 days a summer. So my true path was like, this is so amazing. And I get to have these experiences and teens were coming with us and having these amazing experiences. Um, so that's what we really started was um, just a social impact. It's just like, let me help you. Let me help you guide you along this journey where you can see how other people live. And if that in, and I believe wholeheartedly that it does change the way everyone looks at life when they get to see that firsthand. Yeah. And you mentioned some of the, the, uh, the, the, kind of the things that they would do, start being service, activities, like doing yeah. activities and services. So kind of talk into what it, types of things that you would do down there, especially in the early stages, the beginning stages. Yeah, so, I mean, we've definitely morphed. We've pivoted a bunch of times. Um, when we started, I was just taking the kids and they were spending most of their day in school. Um, I loved the idea that the teenagers I was bringing down could interact with other teenagers that were their age, that had a different color of skin and spoke a different language and lived in different circumstances, but had like the same wants and needs as the, you know, the kids I was bringing from the States. So I loved just building bridges. I loved the idea that they could stay connected through technology once we left they could stay friends through the thousands of miles that you know separated them um so eric the the activities changed they used to spend it the their days in school and then we would on the weekends we would travel and we would go to orphanages and spend the day just playing with the kiddos and doing haircuts and styling their hair and playing with chalk um and painting, just like I wanted it to be just love that we were giving. Um, I felt like that was something that we could all do and we could all give. So we just played and gave like smiles and laughter and love to kiddos that needed it. Um, and then we supported schools. We'd go and spend a week at a school and um, my kids would attend. My students or my volunteers would attend classes and interact and build bridges and mesh cultures and mesh languages. And then we would deliver donations and deliver food to hungry families. And like we met a woman, um, one of our first years, we met a woman who was cleaning house for one of um, a, a woman that we knew down there. And she was very pregnant. And I have worked with women and moms in labor and postpartum work and birth work for a long, long time. So um, I was like, are you getting all the things you need? Like as a pregnant woman, you know, are you getting the things you need? And obviously she wasn't. So we just took her under our wing and we went shopping for her every single week. And um, instead of um, like overwhelming her with a month's worth of food, we just decided to just break it up and do like a week's worth of food. And when we went, like her living conditions were extremely eye opening for me and my entire group. Like we were like, oh, okay, like you're all sharing one, one bedroom and there's four of you that live here and you're, you know, you're washing your clothes by hand and you're bringing the water with by buckets and you start a fire when you want to prepare a meal like this is different like this is really different so the activities were so that I was hoping to create eye-opening experiences for all of us so that we could just live and learn um, about the differences of what it really is like to live in a developing country yeah and when you were bringing, you mentioned some of the girls with you, right, that you knew that were volunteers to help. What was that, what were those conversations like with either their parents and, and trying to say, hey, I think that you should bring your 
have your girls come down with me for a month at a time. Yeah. Truthfully, it wasn't really my idea. So I had other parents reaching out to me and they were like, oh, wait. So I heard that you're taking your girls um, for a month. Like, can you take my kid too? I was like, hmm, okay. So if I'm in charge of your kid, then you can help us pay for my trip. Sure. This sounds like a great plan. So, um, yeah, it just, it, I think so many parents were also seeking and are still seeking that they want the exposure. They want the eye-opening experiences for their children, if not for themselves. Um, I have, so we're leaving for Guatemala in a couple of weeks. I have this darling, like 17 year old high school student that is elated. She is so excited to come. And a couple of days ago, her and her mom came over and we were packing donations, getting some things ready. And one of the other volunteers asked the mom, she's like, well, why aren't you coming? And the mom was like, oh no. She's like, I've never left the country. I am terrified about travel. Like I, I stay home. I don't travel. Like I was like, I love that. I am so proud of you as a person, as a mom, that you are not clipping the wings of your child, that you're just like, okay, honey, like this is scary to me, but you're, you know, but if this is your dream, then I'm going to help you make it. Like I'm going to help you with it. So yeah, I mean, we've got all sorts of people that we've got lots of people, volunteers that have never traveled. We've got volunteers. I've got a couple coming this, this next trip that have never left the country. I mean, I've got, we used to take kids that had never been on an airplane. And so their first, you know, like their first airplane trip is like with me and we're leaving the country, you know, like, so we've had so much fun and parents have been so awesome and kids and all of our volunteers have just been amazing as amazing as can be yeah and setting up the donations as well kind of talking to what kind of led to the whole process of setting things up logistically well it's kind of a logistical um puzzle for sure so and it's i think it's gotten easier um, in the past, we would travel to a different location, a different organization, and just put our energies and our monies into that organization. And so we traveled a lot and did donations in a lot of locations. Um, then a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to start our own preschool and our own nutrition center. And that meant that we're like more focused, um, in one location. So that, with that being said, it has become a little bit easier to do our donations because more often than not, they're going to one location. We're in one village, we're working with multiple schools there and multiple families and you know, in organizations there, but it's like in one area. Um, but it's kind of funny, like people are like, how do you get donations down there? I'm like, in luggage, like we, so I've got um, like regular donations of people dropping off their luggage on my porch and we just fill luggage. I've got awesome people like with boutiques that every season they send me their unused items because it's better for them to write it off as a tax write-off than to sell it for a huge loss. Um, We've got Mary Kay ladies that donate all of their unused makeup and cleansers and, you know, just fun stuff like that the moms in our community would never be able to afford. So um, school supplies and backpacks and hygiene kits and newborn baby kits, like really um, we've taken almost every kind of donation like that you could imagine. Um, so we're always brainstorming on donations and it's always kind of a juggle to, to figure it out. And my husband's a really good sport um, because we have a garage that's full of donations. So whenever we're, yeah, 
we're just always like, okay, let's stick it here. Let's stick it there. And then we'll get it down to Guatemala. Yeah. What the, the girls that go down with you as everyone's preparing, because you're talking to the story about the one who's so excited and her mother is like giving her that experience mm-hmm. as opposed to like l- limiting that from her. Right. So like when you talk about her and the other girls that are going with you as they're preparing and getting things ready, how involved are they as far as like packing everything, the donations in that whole process? Well, um, just to be clear, we, we do take both genders. So we have volunteers that are both male and female. We've got um, a handful of males and a handful of females this year. So I invited them all to my garage. And so we could just like pack and weigh and pack and weigh um, the donations. Um, when So I live in Utah. When I have volunteers that are from Utah, then they can come to my house and we can work together. Um, when we've got volunteers that don't live in Utah, then I give them a list of options that they could fill with their like donations that they could fill their luggage with. Um, so they can be as involved as they'd like to be. Um, I've had volunteers that fill two, two pieces of luggage, which is a hundred pounds of donations. And, you know, they get the community involved and they get their churches involved and, you know, they have a blast with it. Um, I also have volunteers that are like, uh, can you just give me two bags and, you know, I'll carry them for you. And that's it. So, yeah, I mean, I do, I, I do want it to be like an optional item that just like here, this is what we're doing. And like, I'd love your support, but I don't want to like force the donations on our volunteers either. So, but so far we've always had people bring very well um, and very much needed donations. Yeah, one of the things that we had talked about prior to recording that you mentioned about land mm-hmm. and like how you know, you just gotten some land down there and how it, the whole process with that and that experience, what, what are you looking to do with that land? Well, it's such a cute little piece. Um, it's, I mean, it's just a different, it's a different way of life buying something in a developing country. Um, this area has not yet been like mapped out. So we had, we're hiring a topographer to come because um, we know like so many meters and so many meters and from here to here, but it's never been like put on a map or like sent to the, you know, the mayor or the county. Um, so we're working on that as we speak. Um, and then my goal is just that we can continue building it. Right now there's a small home on it and we're working on fixing that up so that it will become our sewing center just so that we have a place for our moms. So we had a lot of moms um, that have this skill. They know how to sew, but they don't own a sewing machine. So I wanted to give them the opportunity to create income um, with their skills. So we've got moms that are making handmade reusable shopping bags that are that are like you know hand woven plastic um that reduce plastic bags at the market but are also super fun and colorful and you know we've got people using them as beach bags and gym bags and pool bags um we've got moms that are making jewelry and like just items like that so we wanted a location where our moms could come and work um, that was a safe place for everyone to come. And then ha- they'll have the option to utilize the sewing machine when they need to. Um, and it, then our goal is to have additional products for them to be sewing and that we're selling and exporting um, to create income. Yeah. Um, as far as creating those different products for them, is that something that you're looking to do like continuously or is that something that's kind of like during certain seasons or is that something that's going to provide income for them basically year round? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely our goal is 
that it's something that's sustainable and monthly and annually so that they are not stressed to be able to buy groceries um, for their families. So the land has space enough for us to build um, multiple options. And so like our big dream is to build a volunteer center, um, which would be like all sorts of multi-purposes, but it would be our preschool. It would be um, a kitchen for our, our moms to utilize um, and just like a community center. Um, and then a safe place for our volunteers when we're in country to stay. So it's, it, that's in the works. We're going to be putting something like super cool on the land. And then the whole goal is to just improve the, you know, the community. So allow them to be more self-sustainable and to have income options and opportunities that are on a regular basis so that they're able to pay for school for their kids and buy the meals that they need and buy the, take care of their families as we all want to. Yeah, and you mentioned that is, and also how a lot of them are malnourished. Mm -hmm. Are there certain things that you're, you're implementing, um, maybe structures in place or um, having people come down to provide them with the, proper nutrition or are they, you know, farming certain types of food, like growing that, the agricultural aspect of it too? Yeah, you know, yeah, at? for sure. Guatemala ranks like around the fourth most malnourished country in the world. So we have serious, like it's a serious uphill um, battle. We have volunteers on a regular basis that are weighing and measuring our kiddos. So we've got kiddos that are coming for breakfast and they stay for preschool they leave after lunch so we've been able for the last two plus years we've been providing meals for these kiddos and we've been able to watch them grow and their statistics their height and weight grow with them and that's been amazing um so we implemented like the governmental tracking We've got a doctor that inputs their information, um, our medical director, and so that we can track if there was like a medical concern, one of our kiddos wasn't eating, you know, like that we would know if something was wrong nutritionally. Um, and then we have recently, just in the last month or two, we've started um, garden towers with the help of a really cool foundation here in Utah. And so they're helping us provide garden towers for all of our families. And we're starting with our families and then we're just going to expand out into the community. So a garden tower um, that will utilize less water and less space. So it's kind of like a three by three by three like plot um, of dirt that's got holes around the edges and on top. So um, it's like a garden all in, it's like a garden, all in a little container space. So it is really cool. And then once you water the top, the water just goes down to all the other plants instead of just dissipating into the earth. If you had like a square foot garden, that's like six foot wide. So um, we've had a lot of luck with that. Our families are super excited. Um, we do provide dinner boxes for our families, which is an entire box of food that provides dinner for every one of them in their family every week. So that's providing thousands of meals a month to the community. Um, but in order for them to be a part, a part of that program, they are also signing up and agreeing to grow their own food and take care of this garden tower so that we can utilize you know, the vegetables that they can grow. And really we've had success, like the foundation has had success in other countries where the family is able to provide or produce a little bit more food than they need for themselves. And so then it's a little income producing opportunity for them as well. So they're like, oh, I've got extra tomatoes today. And so they can sell those to their neighbors and sell them at the market. So we've had a lot of success with agriculture for sure. Um, I mean, Guatemala produces a ton of food 
they have a fantastic growing season. Um, so with that being said, it's a lot of education that it's just, we, you know, we just, we're working with families that may not read and may not write and most often don't. So it's just about teaching them and helping them with skills that will improve their lives. Yeah, and then you mentioned the school as well. So what, like the like preschool, are you looking to expand into like their equivalent of like middle and high school too? Or? Um, so I am not a believer in building something that's already built. So I would, so what we're doing is teaming up with a local school um, and they are a super cool school that runs to, they actually run through the sixth grade. So that we're just going to, we are matriculating kiddos from our preschool. So once they finished our program and are aging out of our program, then they're headed over to this awesome school. Um, so I believe that it just, it's a much better philosophy to um, just help sustain a program that's already in place. And so we are gonna be just supporting them. We're helping them with school supplies and helping them with their um, building a, a library and you know supporting them with the books that they need for that library. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Guatemala and we provided new water filters for every classroom and the staff rooms as well. Um, clean drinking water is always an issue. So now that we've got filters in every classroom, I mean, then we've got the opportunity. It's just like, you know, we know how important water is to drink and they just don't have access to it for the entire school day. So it just didn't make any sense to me. I was like, okay, we need water filters like right now. So just slowly and surely, I mean, we're grassroots, like we're, make, we're making the difference every day that we can. Um, so we will be supporting the local schools that are already doing good work and just helping them be more successful um, if that's at all possible. Yeah. And where would you see like the next maybe one or two biggest needs right now as far as building up the community? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So let's think. Um, for our community, like our big focus is building our volunteer housing. So it just, would, it's going to make our lives so much easier to have a single place where all of our activities are housed and everything is in one location instead of for volunteers, we're traveling from hotel to hotel or city to city with donations and donations. So it will just make our lives easier to have our just one location. Um, and then it will create that community center as well. It will also create income opportunities for our families and our moms. Um, we, they would be the ones that are hired to come prepare meals for our volunteers and to clean the, the room, you know, the, the housing and, you know, so it'll be like a lot of different opportunities involved. So that's like our biggest goal right now, as far as um, our community is to build our volunteer community center. Um, and then the other outside, like inside people's homes, um, we're always working on water filters, making sure that families have clean water and then garden towers so that they have the opportunity to grow their own food and eliminate the like financial burden on our nonprofit of providing food. If it's something that we can grow, then we can put that money towards other items. Yeah, yeah. And for, for those who wanna get involved, what would, what would be kind of the, the best ways to do so, whether they want to go down and be part of it or donate? What are yeah, kind of some got, ideas? We have loads of ideas, Eric. <laughs> so people, um, you know, I am surrounded by super cool, super awesome, um, humanitarian-minded individuals. Um, so we have sponsorship opportunities. Um, our kiddos are all sponsored by individuals in 
Europe and the States and Canada, we have monthly sponsors that sponsor kiddos to, um, in our preschool to make sure that they're getting their breakfast, they're getting their lunch and they're getting their education covered and paid for. Um, we have um, corporations and CEOs that are involved on a monthly basis, donating to make sure that we can do projects like the water filters and like bedding and provide beds for our families and just all of the things that we're working on. Um, and anybody can, can come, like anybody can come and you know, volunteer and work alongside us in Guatemala. Um, maybe some out of the box thinkers, a CEO, a corporation, um, a doctor, a dentist that wants to bring her whole office, you know, like, okay, let's close down the shop and go do service work for a week as a team building experience. Like any of those people are definitely welcome. And those are definitely my kind of people. Great. Great. And what would be the best way to get in touch with you and to be a part of um, and be more of a humanitarian? Yeah. So um, we're online in all sorts of different locations. I know it's a busy, chaotic place on there. So behumanitarian.org is our website, just behumanitarian.org. Um, and so you can find all of our information on that. We also have another website that's got a lot of super fun past volunteers information and past trip information. Um, and that's Guatemalan humanitarian tours.org. So I know that's a mouthful. It's Guatemalan humanitarian tours. Perfect. So yeah, we'll make sure we have all that in the show notes. Toby, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time uh, to share with us your passion and wanting to help others in underserved environments. Thanks so much, Eric. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Absolutely.